Uh, hello and good morning, everyone. Welcome to Secure World's uh, webinar, Russia's ASAT test, what does it mean? I'd like to thank everyone for coming. Um, um, and day whatever of quarantine, uh, we're really glad that there's interest in the issue that we think is extremely important and thought provoking and we look forward to having a fascinating discussion. We've got a fantastic series of panelists up and um, looking forward to you hearing what they have to say. And then of course, we'll be opening it up to questions from you, the audience. Um, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Victoria Sampson. I'm the Washington Office Director of the Secure World Foundation. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, just a little bit about Secure World. Um, since we have a fairly large contingent here, you may be unfamiliar with our organization. Uh, we're a private operating foundation that promotes cooperative solutions for space sustainability and peaceful uses of outer space. Our foundation acts as a research body, convener, and facilitator to promote key space security and other space-related topics and to examine their influence on governance and international development. Our mission is to work with governments, industry, international organizations, and civil society to develop and promote ideas and actions that achieve the secure, sustainable, and peaceful uses of outer space, benefiting Earth and all its peoples. We translate this mission into actions aimed at raising the salience of space sustainability, building common understandings of complex issues, facilitating dialogue, and promoting co cooperative governance of space activities at the national and international level. And just a little bit about organization, we're still working on our 2019 report, but just to get a sense, in 2018, Secure World Foundation completed 120 projects and activities in over 20 countries on six continents on a programmatic budget of about 1.5 million. So we're small but pretty agile. Um, next slide, please. Uh, we'll be going into this more later on, particularly my colleague Brian will be talking about this. We wanted to make sure everyone was aware of an annual report that Secure World puts out um, on our global counter space capabilities and open source assessment. So what we do in this um, um, threat assessment is we look and see what you can find in terms of unclassified open source information about um, five different types of counter space capabilities. Uh, we try to get a sense of what we know and what we just are conjecturing and really getting the idea of increasing the transparency in the discussion about these different counter space capabilities. We look at the United States, Russia, China, France, India, Iran, Japan, and North Korea. And um, it's available on our website for free. There's an executive summary, if you'd rather not read all 140 plus pages. Um, but you know, the long story short is that currently, only non-kinetic capabilities are actively being used in current military operations. But that doesn't mean that there aren't counter space capabilities being developed and tested and thought about. And that's what we'll be going into more when our, with our panel today. So with that, actually, let's go into um, our panelists. Uh, next slide, please. So you've already met me. Um, our first panelist is uh, Dr. Brian Whedon. Uh, Brian Whedon is the Director of Program Planning for Secure World Foundation, has nearly two decades of professional experience in space operations and policy. He is a member and former chair of the World Economic Forum's Global Future Council on Space Technologies, a member of the Advisory Committee on Commercial Remote Sensing to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and Executive Director of the Consortium for Execution of Rendezvous and Servicing Operations. Uh, hello, Brian. Thank you for joining us. Good morning, Victoria. Glad to be here. Great. Um, our next speaker is Michael Thompson. Michael Thompson is a satellite analyst and open source researcher who tracks military space programs. He is currently finishing his graduate degree in astrodynamics. And Michael, I think it's the first time we've had you at one of our events. Thank you so much for being willing to share your expertise. Absolutely. Thank you for the introduction, Victoria. Our next speaker will be, um, sorry, Pavel Podvig. Pavel is an independent analyst based in Geneva, where he runs his research project, Russian Nuclear Forces. He is also a senior research fellow at the UN Institute for Disarmament Research and a researcher with a program on science and global security at Princeton University. Thank you for being here, Pavel, and good afternoon to you. Okay. Yep, thank you. And then finally- Thanks for coming. Thanks. And then our last speaker is Chris Newman. Professor Chris Newman, BA Honors, PhD, is a professor of space law and policy at Northumbria University in Newcastle. He has been active in teaching and research of space law for over two decades. 
Chris has published extensively on the legal and ethical underpinnings of space governance and works closely with the space industry in the UK. Hi, Chris. Thank you for coming. Hello, Victoria. Thanks so much for having me. Okay. So how it's going to work is we've done our intro. Um, the panelists are each going to speak for about 10 minutes each, sticking to the time frame, guys. Um, the one thing about not being in person is that I can't hand you guys notes when it's getting close to time being up, um, but I trust you. And then uh, we'll open into Q&A. Um, I will have some questions to kick off, and then we'll try and get some questions from the audience. Uh, next slide, please. Great. So how this works, um, if you're unfamiliar with Zoom, um, in order to ask Q&A, uh, find the Q&A button, click on it, first step. And then you can look and see uh, what questions have already been asked. You, you can upvote ones you think are interesting and you want to have answered. And then if your question has not already been answered, please feel free to type it in as succinctly as possible and we'll try and see if we can get it answered for you. So I will point out as well, this is pretty obvious since we're um, on an internet recording, uh, this event is on the record. It is being recorded, media are present, and we will be uh, doing a transcript as well. So the recording uh, will be up on our website at some point in the near future, as will the transcript. But just kind of to let everyone know that this is happening. And with that, I think um, let's go to our next slide. All right, uh, Brian, you're up. Thanks, Victoria. Um, so I'm going to start off just by giving a, a background overview of the New Doll program um, and Russian countries programs in general. So next slide, please. Uh, first, to remind everybody that, that this is not really a new thing. Uh, the, this, uh, the thing that Russia tested uh, uh, just uh, recently was um, a missile for a direct ascent ASAT weapon. Um, this is not a new capability. These capabilities have been around uh, since the early days of the Cold War. Uh, during the Cold War, the Soviets built a missile defense system called the A-135 that was emplaced around Moscow. And uh, it was like at such the time that it likely had a DA set capability. Uh, the Soviet A-135 system had two interceptors, um, one uh, that the uh, that NATO called the Gorgon, um, and then uh, a, a one that was called uh, the Gazelle. The the Gazelle was a short range, what they called a, a, a basically internal to the atmosphere, um, but the Gorgon was an interceptor that would go exo-atmospheric um, and was assessed to probably have been able to to hit satellites. Um, and of course, it had a nuclear warhead on it, so you didn't really have to hit it, you just kind of had to get close. Um, on the right here, you can see a, a drawing of uh, the 5-1-T-6 missile, which was the Gorgon, um, and at the time it was a silo-based. So this system was first deployed in 1992, um, and this particular missile, the 5-1-T-6, was retired in 2007. Next slide, please. Um, What's going on today uh, is Russia is developing a new capability uh, that is known as the PL-19 or NUDAL. Um, and this program began in, uh, as far as we can tell, in 2009. Uh, there were contracts signed with the primary entity, which is Ames Atni, um, and then several subcontractors that are also working on the program. Um, these are all sort of, you know, the, the, so the Russian equivalent of Northrop Grumman and Raytheon defense contractors that have a long history of building space and ballistic missile programs uh, within Russia. On the right, you can see an artist depiction of uh, the New Doll system. And this actually comes from an almost any company calendar. Uh, and, and this, as, a compa as compared to the previous uh, Gorgon, which was a silo-based missile, uh, what's being developed now is a mobile system built around a transport rector launcher. Um, far as we can tell, the, as we said, the contract started in 2009. The, uh, the first testing of the kind of a ground testing of the rockets uh, was in 2013. And then there have been several flight tests since then, uh, which Michael's going to talk about in a little more detail. Um, it is a tail-based system. Uh, it's got a solid rocket with a kinetic kill vehicle payload. Uh, there seems to be three major components. There's a rocket, there's a separate command and control system, and then a separate radar system. Next slide, please. 
Uh, just a brief comparison of, of the Nudal uh, to some other systems that are out there. You know, Russia is not the only country that has tested or is developing uh, direct SNA SAT capability. Uh, so you have the, the Russians working on the PL-19 Nudal. Um, second from the left there is the Chinese DF-1C, which is likely the basis for their SC-19 direct SNA SAT weapon. Um, the third slot, you see an American Standard Missile 3. Uh, this was used in 2008 to destroy a U.S. satellite. And then on the right, you have the Indian Prithi Defense Vehicle Mark II. Uh, this was used last April, sorry, last March, uh, to destroy an Indian satellite. So these are the, the four programs we know of at the moment that are either at, under active development or have recently been used uh, to, to, to destroy um, a satellite. Um, and so they're, you know, considered to be potential direct and ASAP capabilities. Next slide. So finally, I just want to talk briefly about where this fits into Russia's overall counter space portfolio. Um, and this is an assessment that came directly out of our counter space report. Uh, in, you know, looking across the breadth of, of counter space capabilities, uh, direct ascent, co-orbital, direct energy, electronic warfare, space situation awareness, uh, Nudal fits into that first line, which is LEO direct ascent. Um, and it's clear that Russia is currently doing active research and development and is flight testing this capability. Um, we we do not, it is not, as far as we can tell, it's not operational. That is probably at least a few years away. Um, and, and, you know, it appears to be only going against low Earth orbiting satellites. Uh, at this point, we don't have any evidence to suggest Russia is conducting flight testing or development of a direct ascent against higher altitude orbits. Uh, at the same time, Russia is developing rendezvous and proximity capabilities that could be used for co-orbital anti-satellite technologies, uh, including some recent tests in low Earth orbit that did produce debris, and that could be an indication that it actually was some sort of a co-orbital ASAP test. Um, absolutely developing uh, research and development for direct energy weapons. Uh, and, and the big capability that Russia has been working on and actually using operationally is electronic warfare. We've seen some very sophisticated systems deployed, Ukraine, Syria, elsewhere, uh, that Russia is active. Uh, and finally, Russia has a pretty advanced space situation awareness capability, uh, which is what we'll need to be able to target other satellites. And with that, um, I'll go ahead and stop and turn it over to Michael. All right, thanks, Brian. Um, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, kind of what we can what we can get from this test in terms of um, in the open source world, uh, and then also you know how these have compared to previous tests and um, things like that. So next slide, please. All right. So um, one thing that I wanted to point out uh, is that so all of these tests come with navigation warnings. Um, and these are pretty standard airspace or maritime closures for any number of different reasons. Uh, it could be scientific operations, it could be military activities, um, gunnery operations, things like that. Uh, and then particularly relevant to this case, uh, rocket launches. So um, rocket launches, you know, warnings that we get from that, they allow us to identify these tests before they happen. Um, in this case, we actually knew or at least suspected um, based on navigation warnings that this test was coming um, around six days beforehand um, and that allowed us to do um, some some essentially preparation analysis um, for if there was for example a, a kinetic impact and things like that uh, so next slide please uh, so I wanted to, to point out here um, and this is something that I actually went back and, and double checked this week because I wanted to be sure um, every known noodle test, um, this is the 10th one, um, has put out navigation warnings multiple days in advance. Um, most of them have essentially two portions. Uh, there's a first stage uh, splashdown that you can see uh, there in the lower left on this map. And then in the upper right, uh, there's an eventual splashdown for the um, kill vehicle or upper stage or, you know, whatever you really want to call it here. Um, and so that's, this kind of constrains um, the, the direction of launch, the launch site, uh, things like that. So next slide, please. So um, something that I wanted to point out is that 
uh, there are likely uh, little to no difference in navigation warnings for um, what I'm calling here just a flight test, um, which is what we saw. Um, it's not impacting anything, and a potential kinetic test. Um, it's it's kind of assumed that uh, if there was going to be a kinetic test, an actual hit to kill test, uh, the navigation warnings would look very similar. And so something that I, that I had looked into was essentially analyzing the objects in orbit uh, at the given time frames uh, to attempt and spot, um, well, are there any targets that look particularly promising for, for a kinetic intercept? Um, and, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that specifically for this test um, next. So next slide, please. So, so now I'm talking specifically here about the, the April 15th test. Um, so the navigation warnings, it constrained the timing and the location of the test. Uh, it was somewhere between 1500 and 2100 UTC uh, in Plisetsk, uh, which is where the Nudal program is based, or at least has performed test launches in the past. Uh, based on this timing, um, we can, and I have in parentheses here, kind of with a, a laugh to myself, we can relatively quickly constrain a list of possible targets. Um, I say relatively quickly because, well, there's a lot up there, as you're going to see in a minute. Um, but an isolation of essentially every Russian satellite that passed through that area that kind of combines the first stage and the splashdown warnings, um, it yields this big corridor. And we can go through and, uh, and try and pick out specific things that look promising in terms of um, potential targets. Um, and I will say here that the navigation warning this time, it's a six hour window. Um, past tests have been more constrained. Um, I, I think I've seen as low as like two hours, an hour and a half for some of these navigation warnings. So it's not all um, six hours, which makes it hard to narrow down exactly. Um, well, are they trying a near miss of something or things like that? Um, but, but that's the kind of thing that we can definitely get um, if we had kind of a, a better constraining of the, the actual timing of the test. Um, so if you can go to the next slide, please. So uh, here, uh, a lot of potential targets. So this is for the full six hours. This is essentially every Russian um, satellite that passed through that, that kind of blue window that you see down there between the first stage splashdown and the eventual kill vehicle splashdown um, for that six hour period. Uh, next slide, please. Right, but um, I wanted to say we can still narrow it down a lot further than that. Um, we can talk about well, what type of objects are likely to be ASAT test targets. Um, and the answer is, well, first off and foremost, uh, low altitude targets. I think we are past the point of, you know, the 2007 Chinese test of blowing something out of space at 800 kilometers and essentially leaving debris there um, permanently. Um, I, I think I would hope that we are past tests like that. So really what we're looking for is we're looking for low altitude objects and um, specifically dead or recently launched satellites with unknown functions. Um, and I put a few examples here. Um, Microsat R, uh, that was the target for the Indian test in early 2019. Um, it was most likely a dedicated target. Um, we didn't necessarily know much about it um, when it launched. We had some images but it was very murky as to what its actual purpose was. Um, we think at this point it was most likely essentially a dummy satellite that was just put up there to be shot down. Um, USA-193, the US test, um, it was a malfunctioning and very quickly decaying satellite. It was set to reorbit or re-enter within a matter of days or weeks, um, and it was shot down. And then the Chinese test back in 2007, um, that satellite had died years before. Um, and so essentially using common sense to, uh, as to what might actually be a target, uh, you can really vastly narrow the potential targets. And if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, and this is a much more manageable scenario. Um, and so then all of these objects can kind of be um, examined one by one, just based on what we know about them, things like that. Uh, so I'm not going to go through every single object here that I had kind of that I had kind of picked out as well this is potentially interesting uh, but I will talk about a couple um, and kind of like the, the implications of that so next slide please so so this is a, a couple highlights from the target search um, you know a couple things that I found were really interesting 
Um, one of them was Cosmos uh, 2535 through 2538. Uh, and this was a quartet of satellites from late 2019 of relative unknown function um, in terms of the Russian satellites. Uh, we, a lot of times we, we can get at least some information out. We know that they're part of a larger program. Um, in this case, it was pretty unknown. Um, so the first two, 35 and 36, they performed um, RPO with each other, uh, relative proximity operations. Uh, and there's some speculation that 37 and 38 are radar calibration targets for error and defense, uh, or air and space defense forces. Um, and so, you know, depending, you know, you know, you could you could say that a, a large radar calibration target, um, it could be used for calibrating um, ground-based radar, things like that. Um, another interpretation, if you will, is that it could be put up there to make sure that they can track something with the accuracy that they could hit it with an ASAT. Um, I will say that they were quite high for a potential ASAT test, so I don't think that you know they were trying to be hit or anything like that. These are up at 600 kilometers. Um, one thing that really, really stuck out to me was this um, SL-4 rocket body. Uh, it was at very low altitude. It was at 230 kilometers on April 15th. Uh, it decayed five days later. It decayed on the 20th. Um, and also, um, if you can go to the next slide, uh, the geometry of this, it went directly down the firing line. Um, if you've looked at the navigation warnings in the geometry for the Indian test in 2019, um, it was in a slightly different orbit, but this looks very, very similar to that. It travels directly down that firing line. Um, it's very, very easy to hit that essentially head on with the, the ASAT capability that we know that, that Russia and other nations possess. So next slide, please. Um, and so, and so this is essentially if, if you want to do this or if, you know, what we can get from the open source, um, there are commercial SSA organizations, Leo Labs, other, uh, that allow really near real time, real time monitoring of these potential targets as they're traveling through this, um, what I'm calling the firing line. And so with Leo Labs specifically, um, you know, you need to have an account to actually get their like predicted state vectors and things like that. But even without an account, you can monitor when new state vectors are generated uh, just based on their own uh, ground networks. And so um, essentially as new state vectors are generated, you know that, okay, well, that object is still in one piece. So, so essentially throughout the day, you know, sometimes you might get multiple updates as compared to waiting for space track uh, where you get an update, you know, every every day, every two days, depending on the object. But um, but essentially, as new state vectors are generated within hours of overflying that test area, you can essentially cross them off as okay, that's still alive, that's still alive, and you can really understand almost in real time, um, you know, what is actually you know happened in this kind of test. So next slide, please. Um, and so these are some kind of just high level takeaways on, on what we you know, can understand from the orbital analysis, the navigation warnings, things like that. Um, there were potential low altitude targets that could have been used in this test, but they weren't, which is ultimately a good thing. Um, and, and so at the end of the day, um, uh, speaking for myself at least, I don't want to make a huge deal about this test compared to past tests um, because ultimately nothing was hit um, they've done these type of tests before. Um, you know, th it's not like there was nothing up there for them to hit. There clearly was, um, and they chose not to. And I think that that's ultimately a good thing. Um, a further narrowing of that time window could uh, likely constrain the parameters of the test even further. Um, so, you know, it was, it was kind of nice. It was a surprise that the U.S. military had announced this test um, when previous ones were unacknowledged. Um, if they want to throw a time, of, you know, a launch time in there, that'd be great. But uh, uh, maybe that's wishful thinking on my part. Uh, but but this type of framework using essentially navigation warnings and really just basic orbital analysis, um, they allow us to monitor these tests in near real time at the um, you know unclassified if you're government or open source if you're you know NGO think tank uh, level. Um, and I wanted to point out here, U.S. military acknowledged this test. Previous ones were left unacknowledged. Um, and so kind of to, to understand these tests, um, we can't always rely on a statement from the US military that says we're in the process of tracking a direct ASAT. set. Um, some open source work is, is, is definitely needed. Uh, and so that is all that I have, I believe.
on my end. Um, and if you have any questions specifically about the analysis, um, you can either reach out to me or you can throw them in the chat and we can um, maybe get to those during the Q&A portion. So oh, thanks. All right, great. Thank you, Michael. Okay, next we'll have Pavel Pavlik talking about the geopolitical and Russian domestic context and his take on this test. Pavel? Okay, well, thank you, and thanks everyone for uh, joining. Uh, I'll try to be brief uh, and uh, leave more uh, uh, for questions, I guess. So I guess I was a little bit puzzled when I saw that people are asking questions about what does it mean this test uh, because uh, as uh, Michael just mentioned uh, it, it, and Brian also mentioned that there it's not a, a first test it's by my count it's about 10th test but not, none of them were, were successful though and uh, uh, so when I saw that uh, not am notice uh, a few days before I just thought okay so that's the uh, another day in the office for uh, the uh, Russian uh, space forces, and uh, of course uh, the uh, the fact that uh, the uh, U.S. Uh, strategic command announced it almost like in real time that oh we are tracking it uh, that certainly drew uh, people's attention. But uh, but I think it's not uh, it's not something particularly uh, surprising. Uh, in fact, the uh, the United States uh, acknowledged uh, at least one earlier test in December uh, 2018. Uh, there was a bit of information about that, uh, but that was uh, a few months after the fact. So there, this is that would be kind of a, the first uh, real time uh, uh, announcement. So uh, the the question, of course, is that uh, what does it mean in the sense that there is a, is there any kind of a juice? Political uh, plan and grand design behind this uh, this kind of development. It's possible, I would say, but I would say it's fairly unlikely, though, uh, or at least not not necessarily. Uh, what what we if you look at the uh, kind of uh, things that the Russian defense industry is doing, there are uh, there are quite a bit, uh, quite a few of kind of uh, holdover programs from the uh, Soviet days. And uh, uh, ASAT, of course, is a very has its very uh, long history in the in the Soviet Union, and it was a it, it was a very big thing in the 80s when uh, when the uh, they they thought that they have a mission uh, which was uh, to shoot down the American Star Wars uh, satellites, uh, and there were uh, quite a few programs there. Uh, one of them was, uh, in fact, the uh, program to put uh, to convert uh, the uh, interceptors of the Moscow missile defense system A135 into uh, conventional ASAT. Uh, I think the, that program was called Amulet. Uh, there, there were uh, other projects there. There was this contact, the airborne uh, uh, ASAT, uh, also direct ascent. It's never been tested, uh, unlike its uh, American counterpart in 85. Uh, then there, there were all these mines, uh, which also kind of uh, were appearing uh, recently, and they were also in this uh, kind of satellite. They're tra tracking other satellites. Uh, there, there was a project uh, that actually uh, looked at uh, direct ascent ASAT all the way up to the uh, geostationary orbit. Uh, this is uh, Nariad B, and which uh, we now are kind of enjoying. The fruits of that program and the uh, one of the booster stage debris uh, is the actually uh, what used to be in there. So and uh, so again, uh, this is not uh, as I said this is not necessarily uh, some uh, major uh, geopolitical uh, geostrategic development. And uh, in my take is that it's not uh, it's not necessarily a mission driven uh, development either. In a sense that it's uh, it is impossible, or I would say it's fairly unlikely that there is a uh, kind of request from the uh, from the military, or there is any uh, particular uh, uh, strategy uh, that would uh, imply that oh we need uh, an ASAT capability. Uh, it is uh, the way things worked in the Soviet Union. It would be largely the way they work in Russia. The 
the industry uh, is uh, actually has a uh, uh, fairly uh, has quite a bit of freedom in pursuing its projects, and uh, the, it's a very uh, interesting dynamics. But basically, they if if they show that they could do something, they get resources, and that's about uh, how it works. So uh, apparently, uh, since Russia had uh, quite a bit of money uh, back 10 years ago or so, and it was investing in all kinds of uh, uh, military modernization, uh, it's not surprising that uh, this, uh, this project actually was uh, revived. So, uh, but I, I should say that I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm firmly in the uh, ASAT kind of skeptics camp uh, because I, I do think that this is a this is uh, not a particularly useful military capability. We could talk about that. Uh, and in fact, the history of the uh, of the Soviet and the U.S. Uh, ASAT program uh, actually showed that uh, yes, there was uh, quite a bit of excitement uh, early on, but then uh, the Soviet Union actually uh, deployed uh, an ASAT system that was uh, operational, quote unquote, for almost two decades. Uh, the IS system, but in the end, uh, it was clear that you cannot uh, you cannot really do uh, much in terms of uh, military missions uh, with, uh, with ASAT capability. And as I said, I mean there was a, a quite a bit of excitement around the SDI, uh, but that's because sort of the uh, the SDI had it been built was a very kind of as we say target rich environment. Uh, but uh, once the SDI went away, there, there is nothing there. Really. So, uh, and uh, again, if we look at this uh, this particular program, uh, again, as, uh, as uh, Michael mentioned, there, there, were, uh, there were early tests. Uh, as far as I can tell, uh, the test uh, the test actually began in uh, 2014, and uh, the first successful test was in 2015, and then there were like a number of others. Uh, we don't know the exact number because not all of them are are actually registered or but my my guess is that there were uh, there were probably uh, two tests in uh, 20, uh, 2019 so uh, and uh, early tests I know that early tests involved uh, just a, uh, just a rocket just the interceptor uh, no no attempt to uh, to, 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 to do anything uh, with the, with a target, and in fact, I'm I'm I I also was surprised that uh, people sort of uh, were expecting uh, that uh, the that this test would involve uh, an actual intercept. Uh, I would say that the last time the Soviet Union did the actual intercept was like more than 40 years ago, and uh, I would say that uh, the uh, Kind of the Russian designers, they have uh, quite a bit of experience with uh, uh, with missiles, rockets, uh, uh, and uh, uh, space and operations in space and things like that. So uh, there, I, I saw there is a question there that they got uh, quite a few uh, kind of uh, what's up. Uh, sort of does Russia feel they need to keep up with others? I would say that no, not really, because that's not what sort of they don't they don't have anything to prove here, uh, and uh, <clears throat> uh, they could uh, perfectly uh, they could perfectly uh, work on various aspects of the system if they uh, are working on that system uh, by just conducting these uh, kind of a virtual tests, if you will. The only uh, uh, as actually they do with the uh, with the uh, Moscow missile defense, you know that uh, they. they uh, Russia does conduct uh, the test of the uh, missile defense interceptor in uh, Sarusha Gun, and uh, they never involve, well, not uh, for a long time, uh, uh, involve uh, an actual target, but still they, they feel confident that they, uh, they, uh, they, they get the results they need. The only uh, kind of a caveat here, I would say that uh, the, uh, if we look at the possible connection with the missile defense, uh, I suggested, although I'm a bit skeptical that there is a connection. Uh, the, my understanding is that Russia has never really demonstrated that it has uh, a hit-to-kill uh, technology in space. 
that that's certainly you would expect this to be kind of a work done. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, uh, my take on that is that uh, and he took Teal for the purposes of missile defense, of course, and that's uh, what others uh, in the United States in particular have been doing. Uh, but my take is that if it's a missile defense test, then you the, the, big, the, the most important part of missile defense is not the intercept. The most important part is the radar and all the, all the supporting uh, stuff. And, uh, and that is not, you, you don't do these kind of tests in cloud of Plesetsk. There is there is Sarushik on there, uh, where, which has a very uh, massive uh, radar infrastructure. So uh, if there is an attempt to do the kind of a heat to kill experiment, I would expect them to be uh, conducted uh, in uh, from Sarushikan, and uh, there are there is a capability there. So that's uh, let me stop here. And again, I just kind of go back and say that. Uh, if the question is what does it mean, uh, this ASAT test, I would say, well, not really much. I mean, it's not something I, I would necessarily cheer in the sense that it's uh, definitely uh, there is some work there uh, going on, and uh, there are implications uh, of that, uh, but it's not in any way uh, a turn to uh, some uh, some kind of dangerous. Uh, I mean, at least this is not the point where it is turning anywhere, one way or another. Okay, let me stop here and let's uh, give, uh, give uh, new welcome to Christopher, I think. Thank you, Pavel. Okay, okay, next slide. And we'll move on to um, our last speaker, uh, Chris Newman. Chris, it's all yours. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to be relatively brief and I'm going to take us through the basics of the law and how the law relates to ASAT test because actually I don't think the law is the interesting thing here at this point. Uh, I'm going to come on to it. My thesis actually is that in an area space governance generally is crying out for, for norms of behaviour and normative standards that we can look at. I think we've got normative behavior, but I don't necessarily think it's the normative behavior that we're after. So what I'm going to do is, is look at the way in which ASAT tests highlight the intersection between arms control and, and space governance. There's been a lot of discussion in the United Nations, a copy was then at the Committee for Disarmament, but there's seen fairly fruitless discussions on anti-satellite controls. What I'm going to do is look at predominantly the Lex Specialis of space law and by that I'm going to predominantly concentrate on the Outer Space Treaty and look at to see what that can tell us, what that has in specifics about arms control and then also think about the central principles of the Outer Space Treaty because it's those principles that I think the international community needs to reconnect with. Um, because ultimately in the last 13 years, there's been ASAT weapons testing and demonstrations from four major space powers. Um, we're seeing a normative behavior, all right, but it's a norm of ASAT testing occurring. Michael in his discussion talked about, we're not gonna see the, the high level tests. So we're already seeing behavior accommodating and attenuating to ASAT tests. We're now seeing good ASAT tests. So. This is something I think that we need to think about and we need to address. But before I do that, I'm going to go and look at the law and show why international law is not going to perhaps provide us with any assistance at this point. Next slide, please. Yeah, if you could move on to the, to the next slide. Thank you, that's great. Um, so as we say, the Outer Space Treaty is predominantly a security treaty. It was at the time of the Cold War. I won't go into too much detail about it. There are numerous texts and numerous academics who can provide a lot better exposition than I can. Um, but we note in the preamble to the treaties that the use of outer space should be for peaceful purposes. Um, international law scholars recognize, however, the breadth of activity that this can encompass, where peaceful is, is read as non-aggressive. Uh, and of course, every ASAT test and every nation that is conducting ASAT tests will be at pains to stress the defensive nature of their ASAT capability. Um, the operative articles that we're really going to look at is Article 4. Uh, which is the undertaking not to station nuclear weapons or weapons of mass destruction in orbit. Article 4 has those restrictions, but it also has permissive uh, 
uh, areas in there as well. It doesn't prohibit the station of conventional weapons, and nor does it explicitly prohibit the testing of weapons in Earth orbit. Interestingly enough, it does prohibit the testing of weapons on celestial bodies. So we have to assume that that is a deliberate attempt by the drafters to delineate between testing on celestial bodies and testing in Earth orbit. Moving to Article 9, because this is another area that scholars have tried to look at and examine to see if there's any way in which that can limit ASAT testing in Earth orbit. And the discussion that states shall conduct their activities in space with due regards for the interest of other parties. Again, we've seen from the number of ASAT tests that have, have happened that due regard, the due regard principle isn't strong enough to provide an absolute prohibition on ASAT tests. And indeed, with an interpretive view on it, one might say due regard for other state parties might be ensuring that we have defensive capabilities in respect of, of, of anti-satellite weapons. So again, there doesn't appear to be a lot within the Outer Space Treaty that is going to help those who wish to limit ASAT tests. Next slide, please. So with there being nothing in the treaties to prohibit ASAT weapons tests, we look at other arms control treaties. Now discussion moved to the uh, Committee for Disarmament, but, but other treaties have kind of stalled and been consistently in, unsuccessful. China, Russia have offered treaty solutions, but these have been treated with mistrust by the United States, with perhaps some justification given that China and Russia have engaged in ASAP tests themselves. Customary international law has been explored as a possibility to restrict the, the weaponization of space, but opinion juris requires a general and consistent state practice. And as I've already said, we've seen general and consistent state practice, all right, but that consistent practice has been to conducting anti-satellite weapons testing. Next slide, please. So legality aside, states are conducting these tests. And what we're now seeing is instead of a discussion on the prohibition of these, perhaps a move towards an outcome-based discussion. You know, do we, instead of prohibiting the ASAT test, do we instead want to prohibit the damage that this can possibly cause to the Earth's orbital environment? With the normative behavior we're seeing, what we're actually seeing is ASAT tests evolving. So we're seeing lower tests, we're seeing tests using these, you know, software targets, we're seeing debris mitigation and notification requirements. What I think we can see emerging is the states themselves are attenuating these tests. Next slide, please. So what options exist? Well, from a legal point of view, the international lawyer in me thinks what I'd really like is a treaty, an international treaty, a nice solid treaty that we can all latch onto and, and it'll be just like the Outer Space Treaty. However, treaty negotiations seem unlikely. The timeliness of them, we know how long international treaties take to, to actually construct. Is there a will to do this? And are we actually at risk of unpicking the existing treaty regimes? So I think for a number of reasons, whilst the new gold-plated treaty might seem attractive, actually, I think at the present time, probably we're best off looking to other methods. So naturally, the next area we look to is the softer agreements. But you'll notice on my slide there, I've got the EU Code of Conduct. Softer agreements don't necessarily guarantee any more consensus than the more formal treaties. So where does hope lie? Well, as I say, we've identified that states themselves are limiting their behavior. I think possibly the time has come for a state to unilaterally promulgate guidelines as to what ASAT tests should look like or state what their ASAT tests will comprise of and at least start the discussion because at the minute the you know, the, the, the Paros and other treaty negotiations are in diplomatic limbo and sure sign have been resurrected. I think if we're looking for an international law situ uh, solution, we'll look in vain. To paraphrase Carl Sagan, there's no indication that help will come to save us from ourselves. So with that, um, I shall pass you back to Victoria. Thank you, Chris.
Okay, great. So much wonderful information, really thought-provoking presentations by all our panelists. Thank you. Um, we have a lot of questions from the audience. Um, but I think the first question I'm going to ask is one that I share with our top voting one. Uh, Pavel sort of answered it already, um, but I'd like to hear what the rest of the panel has to say. Um, understood that Russia has a history in the Cold War of having tested cold relay stats, um, but as Pavel said, it's been four decades since they've done an intercept. Do you, does the panel think that uh, Russia will need to demonstrate a direct ascent ASAT test just to show as a, perhaps a political gesture, if nothing else, that it can, uh, given that the United States, China, and India have all done so relatively recently? Uh, panelists, I see Brian, um, you, you, want, you want to take this one and we'll go from there? Yeah, I'll, I'll start. Um, I think I, I agree with Pavel that they probably from a technical perspective, they probably don't. Uh, you know, Russia has some very good engineers. They, they've studied this problem for a very long time. So I, from a technical perspective, I think I agree with Pavel, they don't. I guess I'm a little bit worried that maybe from a geopolitical perspective, they might feel they have to. Um, unfortunately, you know, this is what we saw with India was they, they couched it very much in terms that this test proves we're now a, a global space power. And, and and I again I, I get I, that's what concerns me is maybe there might be that sort of a current that that says they might have to uh, or or that leads them to more of a political calculation than a technological one. Again, I I hope it doesn't, but that's sort of what concerns me. Anyone else? If I, if I may, do you want to take this yeah, one again? Uh, no, I, <clears throat> my my take is that. Oh, even the, the political calculation is also, uh, I just don't see why would Russia uh, try to do something. Again, A, it, it, it has nothing to prove really uh, here. And then uh, as there, there was another question there, how this uh, uh, kind of works uh, with, the, uh, with the attempt to, uh, uh, to get the, uh, the PPWT, the treaty to prohibit uh, use of weapons in space. Uh, I think it's just politically, uh, it's it's not a uh, it's not a very uh, it's a questionable it's a questionable uh, uh, measure. Uh, so uh, I, I think that cooler cooler heads would would prevail, and they would just uh, say that uh, okay, because like everybody knows that Russia has this capability, uh, sort of, and it may not be. As I said, it's not, it may not be on par with the kind of a hit to kill American one. They could, uh, they could probably, uh, if if they want to prove something, they would would move into the missile defense uh, hit to kill uh, rather than to uh, ASAT, and then they they would get uh, much more out of that. Okay. Other panelists' thoughts? No. Okay. Um. One of the questions that I had is that, what, do you, what does the panel think, just broadly speaking, about the development of offensive counter space programs and the emergence of space forces around the world? Does that mean that we are leading towards a norm, perhaps as Chris would say, that that sort of capability is useful if only in a political sense, if not a military sense? What do you guys think about that? Chris. I think what we're seeing is almost a, a, a splash of cold water here that, you know, these things were existing. We knew that these capacities were existing anyway. Space forces in, you know, in many cases, I don't want to make too many generalizations, are more administrative exercises than anything else. The classification of, of you know, a re re realignment of responsibilities. So I think what we're seeing here is much more of a, of a reversion to type and actually, when I was talking about, about treaty solutions, I was talking very much, I, I was being as guilty as, as, as anybody as talking as much of this in an arms control context, but actually this is a broader space management problem. We're thinking about, and you know, need to think about the space environment. And that's why I think outcomes related um, solutions are the way forwards rather than looking at the actual tests themselves. What are we looking to really prohibit here? 
And we're looking to prohibit damage to the space environment. We're looking to prohibit or we're looking to, to dampen down security fears. So I think it needs to be looked at across the piece. And I think that's what we're seeing. We're seeing norms and behavior being interpreted where guidance and software agreements are not being, you know, not being taken up. Brian, did you want to add to that? Yeah, I think I generally agree. Uh, and I would add, you know, what we see in our in our countries report of the last three years uh, is, you know, yes, a growing number of countries. I think, you know, we're up to almost 10 that are kind of exploring this space. Uh, no pun intended. Uh, you know, but in terms of, you know, there, there's a, a difference between the breadth of things we're seeing explored from a technological standpoint and then the things we're actually seeing that are moving to operational use. And I think what that indicates is that there's probably at least interest in seeing what is this, you know, how hard it would be to do, maybe let's sort of, you know, do some of the technological development, but there's a gap between that and the stuff that countries are saying, you know, we actually should put the time and effort into making this operational, because those are, those are two very different things. There's a lot more money and a lot more resources to make something operationally useful uh, from a military standpoint. And so we're not quite seeing a full-fledged run towards that. We're seeing a lot of experimentation, some technological R&D development, um, and not quite full-fledged. So I think that, 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 at least I interpret that as a bit of a good sign. Hey, we'll take the good news where we can take it these days. Um, uh, some question about the technological aspects of this test. Um, given that this was either the ninth or tenth version of this test, was this, from a technical standpoint, a, a complicated, sophisticated test? Um, or was it just kind of one in a line of series of tests that perhaps is trying to definitively um, improve Russia's uh, capability in this matter? Um, and along those lines, if it was not a sophisticated test or something like that, why does the panel think that perhaps the United States was so quick this time to speak up and identify that it had actually happened and acknowledge it? And then a third part of that, um, just to make this complicated, um, let's say Russia was trying to actually intercept a satellite or an object. Is there, and this is an interesting question for the audience, is there a sweet spot where you can do an intercept for an ASAT where it'll have the debris come down pretty quickly. Like what should they or should one aim for if they're trying to do that kind of low impact counter space at the time? So um, lots of questions there. Um, who wants to take the first one? Maybe Michael, do you want to talk about whether or not this was a sophisticated um, test or go from there? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I don't see, at least compared to the last test, I don't see anything of more or or less sophistication here. Um, I believe that Pavel said that some of the early tests um, they were just testing out the um, essentially the, the the booster. You know, the, there wasn't actually a kill vehicle on top of it. Uh, certainly, from the from the open source side, it's it's hard to know um, whether it was more or or less sophisticated. Um, if if for example, when the U.S. announced the test, they had said hey, it performed a very close to a hit-to-kill capability or something along those lines, um, you know, you might make the argument, well, okay, this is maybe a little bit more sophisticated than we've seen in the past. Um, but I think based on, essentially based on what we know, um, it's hard to say, and there's not necessarily any reason to believe that it is um, more or, or less sophisticated than, than previous tests. Okay, thank you. What about uh, messaging? Why does the panel think that perhaps uh, the U.S. military was so quick to acknowledge it this time if it was, as uh, Michael said, not that much different from previous tests? Well, so, uh, you know, my sense is that it's, it's sort of a function of a couple different things. Um, one is, you know, the U.S. government and particularly the DOD has been working the last several years to try and talk more publicly about these sorts of things. Uh, we've had a lot of discussions from senior leadership about how they're concerned that there's too much classification and that's preventing them from, you know, more discussing the threats they're seeing and the things they're concerned about. So I think that's part of it. You know, this could be the first 
uh, of what we will see as a more open discussion of these sorts of testings going forward. Um, I think that would actually be a good thing that the U.S. government is, you know, acknowledging these and talking about them. And as, as Michael said in his briefing, hopefully providing more information about that. You know, we'd love to know the exact launch time that this took place. That would really help the OSINT analysis. Um, but there's also, you know, uh, here in the U.S., we have this big domestic discussion going on about the Space Force that's been happening for a couple of years. And I think there is also a, a desire to, you know, use these sorts of threat discussions to reinforce the need for that, right? This, look, this is a perfect example. You, know, you can see the, you know, the leadership saying, this is why we need a Space Force, is to be able to deal with these sort of threats. Which is, which I think is partly true. Uh, it was the, the rise of uh, the growing contested nature of space over the last decade was certainly part of the discussion leading up to the Space Force. Uh, and then, you know, finally, if, if you're, you know, really sort of being a domestic watcher, you're thinking of the budget, right? And you know, the discussions going on about the, the preparations for the fiscal year 21 budget. Uh, the Space Force certainly would like to see an increase, as would lots of parts of the military. Uh, and so I, I would suspect that's probably part of it as well. Um, you know, the highlighting for uh, Congress and others that, you know, yes, there are real threats out there and, you know, we could certainly use a little more money to go deal with them. Thanks. And just in terms of a technical standpoint, um, if anyone wants to take a guess on this, is there a so-called safe spot to have for ASAT tests where you can do it and create debris that's going to be relatively short-lived or is it just generally speaking, you create debris, you're going to have to live with the consequences and you never really know what the consequences are. What do you guys think about that from a technical perspective? Any thoughts? Chris? Chris, you want to, uh, let me, you know, let me, let me uh, try to uh, take a stab at the, uh, there, there is, I, I guess the, uh, you, Victoria, you just answered uh, the question. Uh, if there, there, if there is a sweet spot like that, then uh, in, in uh, I guess today it would be a test that would not create uh, a, a lot of debris, and, or would create debris that would uh, quickly re-enter. So that's uh, that that's uh, that's probably the only uh, real uh, real requirement there. Uh, again, uh, as as I said. Uh, if if Russia would really want to to test the hit to kill capability, uh, I I'm not sure that it would choose uh, the uh, trajectory or the uh, launch from Plisetsk uh, outside of uh, the field of view of uh, missile defense radars. So that's uh, that that would be my take. So that. Uh, so it, just to, to, to add on to that, um, we, we've seen, uh, as, you know, as, as Chris mentioned, we've seen some evolution of this over time. Uh, you know, 2007, the Chinese ASAT test was up at 800 plus kilometers. That was bad because that debris is going to be up there for centuries. Uh, the, the U.S. intercept of USA 193 in 2008, that was down uh, around 220 or so kilometers, if I recall. Uh, much lower altitude. The satellite itself was within days or week of re-entering, um, and, and that was around the same altitude, 225, 250, we saw for the Indian ASAT test. Um, much less debris, and, and it was much lower lived, but I will point out that in both of those tests, there were some pieces that were thrown as high as 1,000 kilometers into LEO, right? So, so just because you're conducting the test down low does not mean all the debris is going to stay down there. Um, it's certainly better than at 800. I, I think, look, if, if you want to say what is the responsible is you don't intercept an orbital object. You intercept a suborbital object. And we saw that, you know, in, from China in 2010, 13, 14, 15, uh, they conducted some tests of their SC-19 system against suborbital targets. And in that case, none of the debris went into orbit. And, and so that was more of a responsible test. Uh, from an orbital debris standpoint. Chris. Yeah, I, I was just going to sort of echo both Brian and, and Pavel's comments and say that actually going higher would be counterproductive for the diplomatic efforts that we've seen over the you know over the past 20 years from Russia and China. If they'd have gone to the to the higher orbits, if they'd have gone to the areas where we think 
a bad ASAT tests, then it would have completely undermined the Paros and, and the other diplomatic efforts that they put forward as well. So I, th I think we're going to see, when we do see continued tests like this, we're going to see them try and be portrayed as, as the safer option, the good option for that very reason. So I think actually they, they almost guard themselves in that sense. I wouldn't put too much thought by that, but I do think it's, it's a cause for another glimmer of optimism. Well, that's somewhat encouraging. Um, we have a couple questions from technical from Michael specifically talking about the navigation warning time frame. Um, the two hour notice, you want to know how common that is? Um, and maybe do you, can you give any thoughts about why it might have been such a large window? Yeah, uh, I'm not really sure. So I, I, I actually, because I saw the question over in the chat, I over here on my other window and pulled up a couple of the, of the past notices. Um, I've actually seen as low as about an hour and a half, um, which is which is nice, uh, or I guess which is which is which is lower than 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 expected. Um, so I'm not I'm not sure necessarily what to make of a of a of a six hour window versus like a one and a half hour window. Um, if you were going to do a you know an actual hit to kill test, you essentially have an instantaneous window. Um, now it's you know it's certainly up for debate whether they would say, "Hey, we are launching at this time," or they might just say, "Hey, we're we're launching this afternoon." Um, so yeah, I'm not I'm not necessarily sure what to make of, of six hours. I will say that six hours, looking at previous tests, especially the more recent tests um, in 2019 and 2018, is a little large. Um, I'm not necessarily sure what to what to make of that though. And was there? I'm trying to remember. Was there a second? question with that? I think that was pretty much it. Just okay, thoughts of yeah. why that might have been the way it was. Yeah. Okay. Um, another question that I had, and it's been echoed a couple times, is discussions about the multilateral dis um, responses to um, space security threats. Uh, Chris, you kind of touched on this a little bit. Maybe um, you or the panel could expand on it. We've had discussions about you know, the Russian and Chinese uh, proposal for the PPWT. Um, what is the U.S responded um, to that sort of um, treaty proposal? Does the U.S. have its own versions of that? Um, and then maybe we could talk a little bit about the recent group of governmental experts discussion on Paros and what actually happened there. If someone on the panel wants to talk about that, if not, I'm happy to jump in. Um, but just really explain, you know, where we are uh, because, um, you know, these, these sort of uh, shared space governance issues are really difficult to solve if we can't even bring them up in multilateral context. So, um, can we go and talk about where we are for space security discussions at the international level? Thank you. Who wants to take that? Um, I'll, I'll start off if I may, uh, sure. because I think what we, see, what we see is that each of the major space powers are opposed to ASAT tests, except their own. They're not happy with they're not happy with 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 others, but they they they're happy with their own because they are for peaceful purposes. Obviously, they're defensive, as we've already covered off, and they're at a safe altitude. They're not, you know, we've we've already got China having established what the bad ASAT test looked like. So I think in in a in a multilateral world, we're seeing an amazing amount of geopolitics and sort of realism reasserting itself in that theirs is bad and ours is good and i think we we kind of need to move past that the, this is an area where i think the international community and individual states can actually move past that by making declarations of okay either this is what we view as safe if we're going to do this this is what we view as safe and these are the outcomes that we will regard as being prohibited these are the outcomes that we think are bad if you do this you will be acting contrary to the international will and countries can do that you know it doesn't take a space power to do that it take and i think we can all guess what they are they're the protection of the orbital environment you know this the problem is there is this balance between if we do stabilize asat tests and have normative behaviors emerging in asat tests we lose the balance on space security so it's it's kind of like a really delicate balance to to manage this this acceptance of asat tests and my sort of realistic approach to that but that has that's not you know it's not a zero sum thing there will be a knock-on effect and it will be in the in the field of space security so i think nations have to kind of decide do they want guidelines on this do they want to start promulgating unilateral guidelines which will say this is what we think and if you do this you will be you will be regarded as bad or do they want to keep up the polite pretense of everybody else's asat test is bad 
Thank you. Other thoughts, Brian. Yeah, so I I think that's right, and I would expand that to say, you know, we we almost so we saw some of this in the in the nuclear testing world, where you know, which uh, you started to see uh, unilateral moratoriums on testing uh, in the U.S. and Soviet Union. Uh, that you know, yeah, there was a couple of breaks where they you know one would break a moratorium and then it would test a couple, but then it'd go back to a moratorium. And, and eventually that led to a broader agreement that let's say nuclear testing is bad and, and it gained general acceptance and then that was enshrined in law. So I could see something like that evolving for this where, you know, it's going to, it may start with a few countries that are going to, that are willing to make a, a unilateral moratorium on testing or even call for a broader one. And then that might, as Chris pointed out, sort of establish a norm that you see then evolving from there. Um, I, I, again, look, I, I think if I put my hopeful hat on, that that's what I think I hope to see. Uh, because as I said, myself and Chris, you know, trying to go straight for the, the, the multilateral treaty prohibiting the stuff is probably going to be tricky. Uh, and I think that the wild card here is missile defense. Um, these, these capabilities, we've talked about a couple of times with this show, that this ground launch missile hit to kill uh, is very similar for anti satellite capabilities and for uh, mid course missile defense. Really hard to, 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 you know, prohibit one and allow the other. And we've seen over the last 10 years or so, you know, a growing number of countries that are interested in missile defense uh, to protect themselves. Now, that doesn't have to be mid course. Uh, I think there's a case to be made that you know terminal terminal level missile defense is probably a an easier to do option than mid course missile defense. But that I think is probably going to be the, the the what what the difficult part of this is is you know if there is a pushback saying we no we need to do hit to kill for missile defense mid course uh, missile defense I think that might be the thing that pushes back against a moratorium on these sorts of ATAT tests. Great, thank you. Yeah, it's almost a mentality of uh, is that test for me, not for thee. Um, and I think one of the real issue that I've seen uh, Secure World co sponsors a space security conference every year in Geneva with, Un with Unidir um, is that there's a real disconnect between what the major space powers see as the biggest threat to space security and stability. Um, Russia and China and the BRICS focus on space based weapons, um, whereas the US and its allies tend to look at almost more as an environmental. Uh, discussion point. You know, space is cluttered, um, space is congested, space is competitive. And so it's really hard to come up with a common response when you can't even identify what your biggest threat is. Is it destabilization? Is it weaponization? Um, and that's been a real problem for the multilateral fora. Um, uh, we've mentioned the PPWT several times. It was first proposed in 2008 and then revamped in 2014 by Russia and China. And it's just been kind of sitting there. I think no, there's been no forward movement. Uh, same with proposals by Russia and China for no first placement of weapons in outer space. Um, but having said that, the United States and, and particularly has not shown a tremendous amount of leadership in terms of providing counteroffers. You know, okay, if you don't like the PBWT or no first placement, and those are, I would argue, those are very problematic options. What what can we do in return? Um, so it's difficult. And um, you know, recently, um, well, relatively recently. 2018 through 2019, there's a group of governmental experts talking about PEROS, Prevention Arms Race in Outer Space, and um, couldn't even come to agreement um, as to what sort of recommendations they wanted to make. And again, these are tricky issues, and not to say that international diplomacy should be able to solve these problems easily, but there are, um, I guess, um, sticking points that there definitely can be for this. Um, with that, I want to have a broader discussion about you know kinetic counter space capabilities does the panel think the sort of thing is predetermined like will the sort of capability be used um, if someone has it eventually is someone going to actually try and use it any thoughts i mean i can give my thought but yeah so i uh, I think there is, a, as, I, as I mentioned, I'm in a, uh, I'm in a skeptic, uh, skeptics camp uh, regarding the actual use of that, uh, that, that capability, uh, because uh, you you don't basically with this kind of a ASAT or whether even with more 
kind of a advanced ASAT, the, the, the mines were uh, higher alt <coughs> altitude uh, uh, ASAT. Uh, it's hard to imagine uh, a military mission in which this, uh, this capability would, would be useful. And uh, and and it works in a way that if 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 a if a state that you want to target uh, really relies on uh, its uh, space uh, capability to the to the extent that by taking out satellites you could actually kind of undermine the uh, the uh, the military capability, uh, then the uh, that state would. Probably uh, uh, would probably uh, take steps to reduce that that vulnerability, and there are ways, clear ways of doing that. You go uh, to uh, uh, distributed capability, you go to smaller satellites, you go to redundancy, and in the end, you just yeah, you can shoot down a satellite, uh, but so what? And this is this is what I'm saying when when I uh, when I when I said that they are the uh, back in the day, uh, the both the Soviet Union and the United States uh, back in the uh, late 60s, early 80s, they just looked at it and they just realized that it's not clear what the mission of this uh, thing is. So I think I'm 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 in in that in that sense I'm an optimist uh, because I I I do believe that these these capabilities. Uh, will not be used just because uh, I, I do believe that they are they don't they don't don't give you much in terms of uh, military capability. You're muted, but I'm assuming that was me. Uh, <laughs> um, no, I, I think I generally agree with, with Pavel, and I just want to use an example here. There was a great article in the Space Review uh, this week about uh, a recap of a decision that was made at the 1975-1976 uh, at the end of the Ford administration, beginning of the Carter administration, about exactly this problem. Uh, you had a U.S. national security uh, uh, process that uh, started with essentially going, oh my gosh, our satellites are vulnerable to all these Russian ASAT weapons, and what do we do about it? Sounds very similar to a discussion we've been having here the last 10 years. And so they convened a bunch of meetings, they had several studies, and at the end of the day, uh, their decision was, we will harden our satellites, we will make them more resilient, uh, and that's how we're going to increase the protection of our capabilities. Uh, uh, but at the same time, they said, you know, we need to have a limited offensive capability of our own to go after Soviet satellites, particularly uh, Rorsat and EOSAT satellites that are being used to uh, detect and target carrier battle groups uh, for anti-ship missiles. And so that began development program of this F-15 launched ASAT weapon uh, that was actually tested in the 1980s, uh, destroyed a U.S. satellite called Solwind 85, um, and, and had a couple other tests. Uh, and it was a big development program. Uh, there was plans for wide deployment, but then the Reagan administration said no, and they canceled it, and it never became fully operational. Uh, because when it came down to it, and they had to make some tough budget decisions, uh, the choice the decision was made that that capability uh, just didn't rise to the same level of priority as other things. So again, this is not a new debate about whether or not you have ASAT weapons, is space contested or not. It's It's been that way for a while. These things have happened in the past, and so far, countries as said have, have explored it, they've done R&D, but, but we have, the decision has always been, you know, this does not really rise to the level of uh, something that's really, truly important, like we've seen other military capabilities. Um, I do want to add just one caveat to that. Um, Pavel is absolutely correct. There are ways to make systems more resilient so that you are essentially, you know, deterring these sorts of kinetic ASAT tests by denying benefits. And at the same time, if somebody does choose to try and destroy a satellite, well, then you just push through it, right? Because your system's resilient. The caveat is the U.S. has been trying to do that for a decade and so far has not really made any progress in making their systems more resilient. So that's sort of the, the caveat is, you know, there, there can be institutional and bureaucratic barriers to actually dealing or actually, you know, coming up with a way to counter these counter space capabilities uh, that can, you know, actually make it so they might 
might be of some use. But uh, again, I, I generally agree with Pavel that so far we've seen they have not really been that useful. Chris, did you want to add to it? Yeah, I think, um, again, um, sort of consensus here on the fact that ASATs themselves, I, I, I very much sit in the, in, the, in the skeptical camp because I think while the law regarding testing is you know broadly supportive of testing i think once we start getting into the actual use of asats and i know brian's been working on the woomera manual the use of asats and the actual destruction of satellites in key orbits and the creation of large debris fields may start intruding into areas where international law not the law of outer space but actually the law of armed conflict starts getting involved and so actually what we what we might have is a situation where use of these these anti-satellite weapons may well contravene the law of armed conflict and so actually the electronic means which don't much more efficient much more sort of predictable and so i think in in the sense in the sense of, of worrying about asats i think actually the legality becomes more more apparent when they're actually used so kind of the, 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 it's almost they would almost be self-defeating to use them because the testing of them isn't illegal but if you if you use them in the in, in the wrong orbit in the wrong circumstances and you have this indiscriminate debris field created then it might well start offending against the, the law of armed conflict michael yeah and i'll also say that another kind of um deterrence to the the possible actually usefulness of ASATs um, is you know in, in 2020 it, it certainly depends on what type of orbital platforms you're talking about um, but if you're talking about for example optical imagery um, in terms of imagery analysis uh, you know getting something at you know 20 centimeters per pixel that's nice. That's eye-watering. We saw that with Trump's tweet from last year. Um, uh, it, it's nice to look at. But, I mean, operationally, you know, what is the difference between something at 20 centimeters per pixel and all the commercial platforms at 30, at 50, um, things, things like that. So, you know, if you're talking about against, you know, U.S. optical systems, um, you know, you, you could, you know, you could take out you know, the platforms that can do this very, very, very high resolution imagery. But, you know, what is the NGA going to do? They're just going to call up Planet and get things that, you know, closer to a meter per pixel. Um, and, you know, you can certainly do a lot with, with that. Um, when you're talking about um, electronic intelligence and things like that, it's, it's a little different. There's not really a commercial market there. Um, but for optical systems, certainly there's a lot of near, um, you know, near comparable uh, replacements available in the commercial sector. Um, and at some point, if you're really trying to deny the ability to view um, or to gather optical intelligence from space, uh, you're gonna you're gonna start blowing up a lot of stuff. <laughs> um, you're gonna you're gonna run out of ASATs before you can really deny that kind of optical capability, at least. Okay. Um... Interesting points. Um, so in terms of looking to the future, um, where do we go from here? Are we just going to, do we just continue on smartly with each country developing their own counter space capabilities and hoping that we can have some sort of international discussion on this? Do we try and stop countries from developing these capabilities? Um, do we get in some sort of like NPT type situation where there's nuclear have and nuclear have nots? Are we going to have space power have and have nots or ASATs have and have nots? Um, where do you guys, where does the panel think that we're going to be going in the future with this? Uh, Pavel's going to take first pass, thanks. Yeah, <laughs> let me try. Uh, I think there is no, well, there, there is a simple answer because, uh, again, the, the, the dynamic is there. Uh, there will be uh, people in the military, in the militaries. Uh, all, all states that, that have this capability pushing uh, to get this done. And uh, however, uh, there there is a there in my view there is a kind of lesson we can we can learn from the uh, from the uh, ABM treaty uh, back in the 1972, uh, which uh, basically the way I I I read 
what happened, and uh, yeah, I looked it to, in, into the record, and you, you could uh, you could too. Uh, what happened was that there was a clear understanding on both sides uh, in the United States and in the Soviet Union that missile defense will not work in any anywhere close to what was advertised. And they, yeah, based on that, it, it became easier for them to get uh, an agreement, the ABN Treaty. So that's uh, that's uh, that how it came about. So I, I think something like that would probably happen eventually uh, with with space capabilities. Uh, there, there is, uh, I think, as long as when people will start kind of working uh, on these things and trying to operationalize them and trying to think of scenarios where these would be useful, they will come to the conclusion that these things don't work and they don't give you any capability. But that should would, would have to be kind of internally understood by all the players. Uh, and, and then it would be possible to have an agreement to limit that and uh, reach a, a kind of understanding on the uh, legal ban on uh, this kind of systems. So that's, uh, we hopefully, that understanding of the kind of a futility of this enterprise would come uh, earlier rather than later, uh, but uh, but it will come. It's just a matter of, and I, and I think it's just a matter of time. And, and I think that one, uh, one uh, what we could do, uh, I think, is to try to kind of push that and sort of to try to uh, go and uh, look closely into uh, why these systems uh, are may not necessarily be as useful as people who have interest in deploying them and developing them uh, uh, lead us to believe. So that's, uh, I think, that's a, that's an important part of the. Uh, of the work, but that's yeah, but that eventually uh, it it would have to come through this kind of a uh, through through the internal bureaucracies, if you will. So that would be my take. Thank you, Pavel. Anyone else in the panel want to um, opine on where we the future looks from here? Brian, well, I'll just just uh, you know, I'll, I'll pick up on the thread we had earlier. I I would hope that there's going to be a country or a group of countries out there that'll be willing to take some sort of a stand on this issue, uh, at, at least at the level of no more deliberate intercepts that create orbital debris. Uh, you know, we've seen some indications after last year's uh, Indian ASAT test that Germany made a statement that suggested they were thinking along those lines. Um, I think Canada made a, a some sort of a, um, a statement uh, in front of the first committee um, uh, last fall. So I, th there may be some of that rumblings out, out there. Of this I would like to see that, and I think that would that sort of our, our hopeful uh, position would be that you know a country or a group of countries would take a stand on this before we do see an actual kinetic intercept the next time. And then that might lead to uh, what Chris and I talked about earlier is some, uh, you know, a couple of countries declaring moratoriums, um, and then we, we would have a, a norm building from there. Chris. Yeah, uh, again, just to, just to sort of agree and back up with what both Brian and Pavel have said, that I think the way that this is, the way that this could emerge, and this is actually a really easy diplomatic win for a nation to, to, to state their own sort of unilateral criteria for what an ASAT test is. I'd go a stage further than Brian, and I would say no sort of intercepts that cause orbital debris period, you know, deliberate or otherwise, so that that then imposes a duty on the ASAT tester to make sure that they don't contravene these international international norms. So I think that, I, th I think, you know, we need to see leadership from countries, leadership from countries that don't necessarily have a horse in the game at the minute, ne leadership from countries who can say, we, we don't want to see tests that damage the orbital environment, because this does go beyond simple arms control, simple arms control. Oh, arms control. This does go beyond that. It stretches into the environmental issue. And I think you were absolutely right, Victoria, when you said that it stretches across into environmental law, into space situational awareness, into the whole range of space activity. And so I think this is a good opportunity for a country to take leadership in this and say, we're going to, this is, this is our red line. Thank you, Chris. And actually, that leads me to my last question I have for the group. Um, obviously, nation states need to be involved in this conversation, clearly for security issues. 
But I think one of the things that that we tend not to recognize or forget for the, as a space domain is changing, that the commercial sector plays a huge role in how we use space and how we feel comfortable about others using space. Should the commercial sector be worried about this? Should they be involved in the conversation? Um, do they have a role to play in terms of establishing norms for space, space security and stability in this issue? Thoughts? Uh, sh short answer is yes. Uh, you know, if, if you're planning a business model that's going to involve satellites operating in low Earth orbit, uh, you should probably be wondering whether or not a country or a bunch of countries may be testing stuff that creates a bunch of debris. Uh, if you are, a, part of your business model is selling data and services to a country's militaries or intelligence agencies, you need to be thinking, am I going to be a target? Should there be a conflict? Do I need to worry about that? Um, I definitely think, uh, commercial companies should be at least involved in the discussion and talking with their governments about these issues. Uh, and, 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 you know, because I think if this continues and we see more widespread testing and deployment, that could be, uh, uh, you know, have a negative repercussions for future investment and commercial development in low Earth orbit. Uh, Chris? I think we've got this strange sort of paradox. Um, logic and international politics are, are uneasy companions, but actually all of the, the, the major space powers who are engaged in these ASAT tests have a vested interest in a more ordered environment. It's in their interests, it's in their collective interests to ensure that space is, as Brian said, a predictable environment so that this commercial activity can absolutely flourish. So I think if that message can get through, and if that message by means of how, by however it happens, by broad international support for limitations on ASAT tests, because that's where we could start, a limitation on ASAT tests, if that could be, could be generated by both, you know, military, diplomatic and commercial actors, then I think the message will get through that actually it's in everybody's interests, but especially it's in the major space powers interest to retain space security and to retain that stability. Um, any last, Michael, you want to add something? Yeah, yeah, I, I'll say that um, kind of building off of what Brian said, um, really any company that their business model involves selling data to the government, um, you know, developed or not developed, um, captured from orbital platforms, uh, they should be wondering, you know, is is it safe, essentially, is it safe for me to do this? Um, and I And I think building off of that, um, one of the things that the U.S. has looked into in, in recent years is to kind of try and have a more distributed like milsatcom um, architecture by using like, hosted payloads and things like that. Um, and I know that there have been, you know, certain companies that have been kind of uneasy with that because they're saying, if I'm hosting uh, a milsatcom payload, um, am I going to be one of the first targets if, you know, if an ASAT war kicks off? Um, and so I think that there's, um, there's, you know, there's, there's this, there's these interacting factors at play where I think that um, if companies, uh, you know, if companies want to further their, their business model and if, you know, if countries want to have more distributed systems, um, I think that companies really should be interested in, um, in this, this type of discussion. Thank you. Um, Pavel, any last thoughts? You're good? Okay, well that puts us right at time. Um, I'd really like to thank the panel for some really fascinating insights and honest discussion. And also I'd like to thank um, the audience as well for um, sending such interesting questions. And it was really interesting for me to hear from everyone literally all over the world um, that shows that this, um, I think this issue is relevant and of interest and important to have a global discussion so we get to some sort of solution that we're all comfortable with, that allows us to continue to use space in a sustainable manner for the long term. So with that, um, I'd like to emphasize again, we will be putting the PowerPoint up on our website soon. We'll be putting um, the recording up on the website soon. Um, transcripts in a bit, um, but um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. And um, we look forward to seeing you, whether in person or most likely virtually at a later Secure World event. Thank you all, have a great weekend. <laughs>